Up to this point in this DVD series, questions may have formed in your mind concerning why children get sick. If 87 to 95 percent of disease has been traced back to what goes on in our thought life, then how can a two or three year old baby get sick when it doesn't have the understanding to even have a thought life? The answer to that question has to do with genetically inherited diseases, which is our topic of discussion for this session. Now before I even begin talking about genetically inherited diseases, I'd like to say be very careful of offence, because if you allow him to, the devil will use this teaching to get you into offence, because when our children are involved, it is a touchy subject. If you get into offence, you are going to be blinded to the truth in what I want to share with you. Offence is the snare of the devil, and he will use it to rob you of your healing, so be careful. I warned you in previous sessions that this will not always be a feel-good message that tickles your ear and gives you goosebumps. But it is a message that will set you free and bring you healing, not only in your life, but in the lives of your children. So if you can't always say Amen, just quietly say Ouch. This scripture is found in Exodus 20 verse 5 and 6 and also in Deuteronomy 5 verse 9. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy and steadfast love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. I've said that 87% of all diseases have been traced back to sin in our thought life. But it is also very sobering to know that our sin doesn't just affect us, it also affects our children. Sin is more than an isolated act. It can reverberate for generations to come. That is why so many diseases run in families. As part of my training as a doctor, we were taught to take a family history of patients in order to gain a full picture and understanding of the disease they are presenting with. Family trees are a very important and useful diagnostic tool. This scripture that I just mentioned is the basis for all spiritual and physical genetically inherited diseases. Have a good look at your own family tree. What diseases are running from one generation to the next? Jeremiah 32 verse 18 says, You show loving kindness to thousands, but recompense the iniquities of the fathers into the bosoms of their children after them. The translation in the Living Bible says, You are loving and kind to thousands, yet children suffer for their father's sins. In Hosea 4 verse 6 we read, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you, that you shall no more be a priest to me. Seeing you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. Remember Deuteronomy chapter 28. The first 14 verses spoke of the blessings that come from obedience. From verse 15 to the end of that chapter, it talks about the curses that come from disobedience. And in verse 15 we read, But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, being watchful to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you this day, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Moving on to verse 59, Then the Lord will bring upon you and your descendants extraordinary strokes and blows, great plagues of long continuance, and grievous sicknesses of long duration. This scripture is saying that all manner of disease is a consequence of sin and disobedience, which not only affects us, but also our descendants, which is our children. All of these scriptures that I have just mentioned show the loss of blessing passed down from generation to generation because of disobedience. Now immediately I know that this topic of genetically inherited diseases is going to bump into a lot of people's doctrine. Before you get your back up, I would like you to just listen please with an open mind because it might be the key to your healing. I am not going to teach you anything unless I am sure that it lines up with the Word of God 100%. One of the main reasons why people struggle with the concept of genetically inherited diseases is because they say, 
I thought that all sin, disease and genetic curses was cancelled at the cross when we became born again. Jesus said it is finished. Well, I have already discussed this misunderstanding in session 5, but I will mention it again here. This is the reality. There are over 700 genetically inherited diseases and the church is full of it. Already there is something wrong with this theology that the curse of genetically inherited diseases was cancelled at the cross because Christians have genetically inherited diseases. If it was cancelled at the cross and you call yourself a born-again Christian and you have a genetically inherited disease, well then according to your own theology you must not be born again. If it was finished at the cross, then how can we as born-again Christians have genetically inherited diseases? The answer to that question has to do with a key word called appropriation. Jesus died for all people and paid the price for all sin once and for all. So does that mean that all people in all of the world are saved? No. If it was finished, why isn't everybody saved? The reason is that we have to appropriate it by faith. And the same principle applies to healing. According to Isaiah 53 verse 5, by his stripes we are healed and made whole. So is every, everybody healed of all diseases? No. Why not? Because as you know from session 5, we have to appropriate it through our obedience. There are so many teachings in the church today that say that as a believer you no longer have the curse because Jesus paid the penalty for the curse at the cross and therefore it can't possibly touch you. You have been taught false security. This theology is completely unscriptural. In session 5 I said to you that when Jesus died on the cross and it was finished, he finished it in his obedience. Some people in the church are trying to appropriate what Jesus did on the cross but are continuing in their disobedience to the word and therefore it is not working. That is why only 2-5% to of people who are prayed for are actually getting healed according to a survey that was done in churches across America. Just because it was finished and Jesus bore the penalty of the curse, it does not mean that you get to keep your sin and have your healing. Galatians 3 verse 13 says that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. This um, um, speaks of our redemption as legal, but it is not automatic. Another problem people may have with this teaching is that most of the scriptures are quoted from the Old Testament. They say, I am under the New Testament covenants, so the Old Testament doesn't apply to me. Well, yes, we are under the New Testament covenant, but the Bible says that Jesus did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. I also spoke about this in session five. When Jesus came, he did away with some of the do's and don'ts, for example, what you can eat and not eat. But when it comes down to instructions in righteousness, nothing has changed. For example, one of the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament is that you are not to commit adultery. It is still unlawful to commit adultery in the New Testament. In Mark chapter 7 pre-cross, Jesus spoke against adultery, and Paul also spoke against adultery in Galatians chapter 5 post-cross. So did not committing adultery change with covenant change? No. The New Testament says that the Old Testament scriptures are for instructions in righteousness. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11 that the stories in the Old Testament were given as an example and warning to us to instruct us for right living. And we see in 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 to 17 that it says that every scripture is God-breathed, given by his inspiration and profitable for instruction, for reproof and for conviction of sin, for correction of error and discipline in obedience, and for training in righteousness, in holy living, in conformity to God's will, in thought, purpose, and action, so that the man of God may be complete and proficient, well fitted, and thoroughly equipped for every good work. The bottom line is this. If you don't believe that genetically inherited diseases exist in Christians, with all due respect, please get real. 
I have to be practical as a doctor. I can't stick my head in the sand and pretend that genetically inherited diseases do not exist in Christians because they do. I deal with it on a daily basis in clinical practice. Through sin, the devil not only has a legal right to our lives, but the lives of the generations after us, because we gave him that right in our disobedience, and it's time to recognize it. The church doesn't even see it. In the experience of doctors, psychologists, and psychiatrists in the medical field, and in the experience of others in ministry like Henry Wright, we are seeing an amazing similarity between the bondages and diseases that follow family trees. We are seeing evidence today that the curse of genetically inherited diseases is still there. Many very sincere born-again Christians who genuinely love God are suffering from diseases that are genetically inherited. So on that note, we'll begin our discussion on genetically inherited diseases at Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 1 right through to chapter 9 verse 3 which speaks of the time when the Israelites had just come out of captivity from Babylon in the days of the prophet Nehemiah and Ezra. All the Israelites gathered together to listen to Ezra as he read the word of God to them. The people wept as they heard the word because they realized that they and their children had been in bondage and captivity because of disobedience. As a people, they came before God and repented, and they took responsibility not just for their sins, but the sins of their fathers in previous generations. In Nehemiah 9 verse 2 to 3 we read, And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners, and stood and confessed their sins and iniquities of their fathers. Why did the Israelites confess the sins of their fathers? The reason was so that they could be free of the curse of sin generationally. They confessed them because they were the product of their parents' disobedience. There is a similar story in 2 Chronicles chapters 29 and 30. King Hezekiah and the Levites got together because their fathers had sinned and done evil in the eyes of God and had forsaken him. They came together before God to repent of their sins as well as the sins of their fathers and to sanctify themselves. Then it says that the Lord heard the prayers of Hezekiah and he healed the people. In verse 1, Hezekiah began to reign when he was 25 years old and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that David his forefather had done. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord, which his father had closed and repaired them. Moving on to verse 4, he brought together the priests and the Levites in the square on the east and said to them, Levites, hear me. Now sanctify, purify and make free from sin yourselves and the house of the Lord, the God of your fathers, and carry out the filth from the holy place. For our fathers have trespassed and have done what is evil in the sight of the Lord our God, and they have forsaken him, and turned away their faces from the dwelling place of the Lord, and have turned their backs. Moving on to verse 10. Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel, that his fierce anger may turn away from us. Verse 15. So they gathered their brethren and sanctified themselves and went in, as the king had commanded by the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. For the multitude of the people, verse 18, Hezekiah had prayed for them, saying, May the good Lord pardon everyone who sets his heart to seek and yearn for God, the Lord, the God of his fathers. And the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah and healed the people. So when you pray for healing, not only must you repent for your sins, but the sins of your fathers also. Why? So that genetically inherited diseases that are running through the generations in your family tree can be broken and defeated. It is not just physical diseases that are genetically inherited, but spiritual problems as well. Over the past few years, the psychologists and psychiatrists have been able to document that personality characteristics and non-genetic factors such as anger, rage, abuse, molestation, addictions, a low self-esteem, divorce and so on, can be passed down through family trees from generation to generation without any physical genetic abnormality being seen or known. Criminologists know that there are crime families. 
We tend to learn the ways and sinful habits of our ancestors to some degree, and so the curse can perpetuate, as the descendants usually practice the same sins as their fathers. For example, we often find a man who beats his wife comes from a home where his father beat his mother. A woman who had a bad relationship with her mother often ends up having a breach in relationship with her daughter. If a woman had a daughter out of wedlock, you will often find that that daughter will also sleep around and get pregnant outside of marriage, and so the sin flows from one generation to the next. When certain sins enter a family tree, they open the door for certain demonic spirits to travel from generation to generation. As an example, let's have a look at the family tree of the founding father of our faith. In Genesis chapter 12, there was a famine in their land, so Abraham and his wife Sarah went to Egypt, the land of Pharaoh. His wife was very beautiful, and Abraham feared that Pharaoh would kill him for her because she was that beautiful. So he told Sarah to say she was his sister. Abraham enticed his wife to lie, and he also lied to Pharaoh. The root problem behind people who lie is a fear of man, fear of judgment, fear of rejection, fear of failure, but primarily the fear of man. By the way, the latest medical researchers made an interesting discovery about acne. For many years, the medical community believed that acne was just the result of excessive oil production in the skin because of the hormonal surge in puberty. But medical research has now made a very interesting discovery that acne is a fear, anxiety and stress disorder related to peer pressure. In other words, the fear of man and fear of rejection. I explain why on a medical level in my book. Children with acne are afraid of other children. They have a fear of man and are overly concerned about what others think about them. Now, I'm not sure if Abraham had acne, but he had a fear of man, and he became a liar as a result. God dealt with Abraham about that, and he repented, but he did not get the message. He left the land of Egypt and moved north to the land of the Philistines, where Abimelech was king. We are now in Genesis chapter 20. The exact same situation as before. He was afraid of losing Sarah because she was very beautiful. So he told Abimelech the same lie that he told Pharaoh, that Sarah was his sister. He got into trouble all over again and had to repent again, but he didn't learn his lesson the first time or the second time. Abraham continued to have the fear of man, and he had a lying spirit. That was the beginning. Moving on to Genesis chapter 26. Abraham's son Isaac and his wife Rebekah went to the land of the Philistines, where Abimelech was still king. Forty years after Abraham stood before King Abimelech, Isaac said to Rebekah, You are very beautiful, and I'm afraid that because you are my wife, Abimelech will kill me to get you. So tell him you are my sister. When you read it in Genesis, Isaac said word for word what his father Abraham had said forty years earlier. I submit to you that it wasn't Isaac speaking. That was the sin that lived within, that he'd inherited from his father, which was a familiar spirit that now had a right to the family tree because Father Abraham gave it that right to stay through unrepented sin. Now we have a second generation of fear of man and lying in Isaac. But it doesn't stop there. The story is just getting going. Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob. Jacob deceived his father Isaac to get his brother's birthright. Jacob had inherited a lying spirit from his father and his grandfather. So we have three generations of liars, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It doesn't stop there. Jacob had 12 sons. Ten of the sons were jealous of their brother Joseph and sold him into slavery. They lied to their father and told him that Joseph had been killed by a wild animal. So there we have four generations of liars, and that's where our faith begins, a bunch of fear-filled liars. But Abraham, believe it or not, was called a friend of God, so there's hope for you and me. As another example, let's have a look at the family tree of David. 
He was known as a man after God's own heart because when confronted with the knowledge of sin, he repented. But King David had an evil, perverse spirit of lust that he had inherited, and his children also inherited it through him, just like the lying spirit with Abraham. A spirit of lust is an evil spirit that likes to manifest itself through humans and do sexual things. Evil spirits want and need humans to manifest their fallen nature through us, and when we allow it, it becomes our sin. David saw the spirit of lust and sexual sin in his family tree, and he knew that it was in him. The reason that I know this is because in Psalm 51, in his prayer of repentance to God, David said this, Behold, I was brought forth in a state of iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. What David was saying is what caused me to go into sexual sin was in my family tree. In fact, it was with me in the womb. What was with him in the womb? Nothing genetic. An evil spirit of lust was right with him, and as he became older, it began to give him urges and it began to give him temptation. When he said in sin did my mother conceive me, don't ask, because David was the youngest son, and it's not a sin to be married and have children, so I don't dare speculate. But what I do know is that David is saying that what caused him to go into sexual sin was in the family and he just acted out things that were family traits. We know that this is true because one of David's own sons raped his sister. And look at Solomon. Can you imagine trying to keep a thousand females happy? In fact, Solomon, who had so much wisdom for others, had none for himself. Those wives eventually led him astray to worship pagan gods. David's family was a tragedy. Another son rose up in sedition and anarchy against him, and one son died at childbirth because of the sins of the father, David. In a moment I'm going to show you that the curse of the sin in genetically inherited diseases runs through the father. So we see that David's family tree was filled with sexual sin. That brings us into the understanding that there are things in families that are invisible that make people act the way they do. The Bible calls this iniquity which is the body of sin. In session 11 I explained to you that sin is a being and not a state of being. It is the invisible kingdom of Satan spoken about in Ephesians chapter 6 that by its fallen nature is strategizing to get you to listen to it and become one with it through sin and it is following you in your personal lives, marriages, families, churches, businesses, and in your nations. It is not the culture that is the problem, it is the iniquity that follows cultures that is the problem. And every culture has its own iniquity. In 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3 it says, I want you to know and realize that Christ is the head of every man, and the head of every woman is her husband. God did not create women to be the spiritual leader of the home. God holds the men responsible for the spirituality of the family. The failure in all family problems begins with the man. The curse of genetically inherited diseases runs through the father. Therefore, to get rid of every single genetically inherited disease on earth, it will have to start with salvation and sanctification of the men. In session 8, I explained that it is the men who hold the keys to this planet. Therefore, when the men finally decide to represent God as father to their children and represent the Lord Jesus as husband to their wives, revival is about to begin. Until the men decide to be a mirror image of heaven as a father and a husband, we are stuck in every generation with over 700 genetically inherited diseases until that happens. It's time that the men get right with God and take steps to sanctify their wife and children. The salvation of the whole family should start with the salvation and sanctification of the father and husband of the home. The fathers are the holders of blessing and curses in the family. You can go and read in Numbers chapter 30 where it explains that the father or a husband is a covering or protection for his wife and daughter. The male lineage traces ancestry through his father, his father's father, and so on. 
what sin and diseases do they have in common with you? You can still inherit a physical disease or spiritual problem from your mother because your mother had a father. The female lineage traces ancestry back through her father and what he brought into the family tree and all the males before him. Your mother had a father and this line channels down through the male. That's why you can inherit things from your mother even though they were in the family tree of her father. There are some things that you are dealing with in your life that are inherited. Start thinking about the desolations and the generations in your family. In the next few days, take the time to go and build your own family tree. An example is shown on the screen. Make a list of the diseases that each person had in the different generations and remember to include the siblings in each generation. Mark down the characteristics. Were your family members in past generations Christians? Were they into occultism or other false religions like Freemasonry? What were their personalities like? What did they do for a living? Were they alcoholics, drug addicts or into pornography? Did their lives contain any of the spiritual elements that we are learning are the roots for disease, like anger, hate, bitterness, strife, long-term family feuds, envy, a low self-esteem and self-hatred? Wife-beater, molester, adulterer, fornicator, murderer, slanderer, division-maker. Go back as many generations as you can, and this will give you an idea of what is in your family. All the people in your family bring into the picture good and evil, blessings and curses. The reason I know this is because many Christians have disease that is genetically inherited from their parents. If it is not dealt with before the Lord, you will pass it on to your children. It is not fair, but that is the price we pay for sin, disobedience, and lack of sanctification. Fear, abuse, victimization, rejection, allergies, heart problems, cancer, diabetes, and a large number of diseases can be inherited from both a physical, genetic standpoint and also a spiritual standpoint. Here's an interesting question. What about adoption? There are people that adopt children all the time because they want to try to give them a better life. There have been parents that have adopted children from babies who were devastated when this little child that they raised and loved to the best of their ability turned into a living devil. And they think, I failed. What have I done wrong? I raised this child in a Christian environment and gave it all the love in the world. While environment does not shape the child first, inherited iniquity shapes the child first if the iniquity has not been dealt with. You need to understand this so that when evil starts to surface in an adopted child, you know how to deal with it. If you have been adopted, you may ask, how can I know the iniquity in my family if I don't even know my father or mother because I was adopted? Well, the answer is very easy. The things that you struggled with all of your life, from childhood into your teenage years and into your adult years, that is what was in your parents. Now you can understand yourself better. I'd like to explain how a genetic defect is made and how it is passed down to future generations on a physical level. Genetic diseases involve a structural abnormality in the strands of DNA in the genes. Your DNA is made up of genes, and your genes are inherited from your father and mother. Each gene has specific instructions on how to make a specific part of your body. For example, you have a gene that has instructions to make your eyes blue or green or brown. You have another specific gene that has instructions to make you a certain height, short or tall. Everything that determines the way that you look and your whole body makeup comes from an instruction manual which is encoded in your genes. When these genes get messed up, the instructions get muddled up, and the result is the formation of a defective part of your body that does not function properly, and this leads to the development of various diseases. The devil is able to get in and alter our body chemistry and genetics through sin in our thought life. In session two, I explained that your thought life doesn't just affect your body, it also affects your genes. 
In other words, a toxic sinful thought life can lead to a gene defect that is passed down to our children. Running closely with the science of thought is a new science called epigenetics. Epigenetics shows that our thoughts and perceptions remodel our genes and not the other way around. This quite brilliantly shows the truth in the scripture, as a man thinks in his heart, so does he become. Epigenetics shows us the power of our thought life and how it affects who we are. A phenomenal discovery is that our genes can be switched on and off by the thoughts that we choose to meditate on. When a gene is switched on, certain proteins are made. Proteins are the building blocks used to make different parts of your body as well as the building of memories. Your genes and the proteins made from them are directly affected by the thoughts that you choose to meditate on with your free will. This has changed the conventional understanding that our genes control and determine who we are and what we become. Recent research disproves the myth that our genes shape us. Our thoughts affect which genes are switched on and therefore we shape our genes. This means that we are not, nor have we ever, been victims of our biology. There are many ways that our thought life can alter our genetics, but let's look at one example of how it happens on a physical level. Cancer commonly runs through family trees as it can be caused by an inherited genetic defect. In session seven, I showed you how a thought life dominated by bitterness and unforgiveness causes cell wall rigidity. Normally the wall around a body cell is like a semi-permeable filter. It allows things it needs like oxygen and nutrients to diffuse into the cell and waste products from metabolism are filtered out of the cell. But bitterness will put your body into a toxic state of stage two and three of stress, which results in high levels of the stress hormone cortisol in your blood. In large quantities, cortisol will cause the cell walls to become rigid so that nothing can get in and nothing can get out. Oxygen and nutrients that the cell needs cannot diffuse into the body cell and the body cells are not able to cleanse themselves of toxic waste. The buildup of toxic waste inside the body cell will corrode the DNA in the genes like battery acid. And this causes damage to the anti-oncogenes, which remember are the genes that will prevent a cell from becoming cancerous through wear and tear. The resultant gene defect can then be passed down and cause cancer in the next generations. This is one of the ways that cancer can be inherited. Our DNA was perfect when God created it from the foundation of the world. However, the devil managed to get in because of generations of sin and mix up the DNA which changed the genetics. This defect that causes the disease is then passed down in the generations in the family tree in the genes. If the devil messed up the genetics, who can fix it? The living God through repentance can. God can change the genetics, and He does, when you get yourself sanctified through repentance of your sin and the sins of your fathers. Repentance, according to the original Greek word used in the Bible, means changing your thinking. According to the science of epigenetics, by changing your thinking, you can change your genes. I haven't had much experience with this myself yet. But in the ministry of Henry Wright, they have documented evidence of genetic code changes. For example, when a disease like cancer was diagnosed by investigations where the genes of that person were isolated and studied by an oncologist, after ministry and healing, a sample of the person's genes were studied again and the genetic pattern was changed and the person no longer had the defect that would cause that disease. They were totally healed, even right down to the DNA in their genetics. So the person is no longer a carrier of the genetically inherited disease and their children will no longer inherit it. When it comes to children with a genetically inherited disease, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 14 that children are sanctified by believing parents. 
It says, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, now they are holy. When the parents repent, the children are healed. In the ministry of Pastor Henry Wright, when the parents came before God and repented of the sin and got it resolved, the children were often instantly healed of diseases without prayer for healing even occurring on their behalf. Colic is an example of a disease in a child that is an inherited fear from the parents. Fear can come in early in childhood or even in the womb through inherited iniquity. The spirit of fear can be inherited and it can run in family trees causing diseases that are rooted in fear. In Henry Wright's book, A More Excellent Way, there's a testimony of a baby who was healed of colic through dealing with the spiritual root of fear behind it. When the baby was born, they brought her home and she began to have all night colic and they couldn't sleep. They even put her on a clothes basket on the dryer one night and turned the dryer on, hoping that the vibration of the dryer would make her go to sleep. They were frustrated. The daughter had inherited a spirit of fear that is the iniquity of the generations, a familiar spirit, a fear of abandonment. They dealt with it and she slept seven hours and they slept seven hours too. She never had colic ever again. When they had another daughter, the first thing that they did when they brought her home is they set her before the Lord by faith and they broke the power of this iniquity that is traveling in her also and the child never had colic one time. When the curse is broken on that level, it is amazing to see God's provision and healing for children that are not yet at the age of understanding. Healing and complete restoration to health was provided by Jesus through his work on the cross. We see in Isaiah 53 verse 5, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our guilt and iniquities. The chastisement needful to obtain peace and well-being was upon him. And with the stripes that wounded him, we are healed and made whole. Isaiah 61 verse 1 to 4 also speaks of Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed and qualified me to preach the gospel of good tidings to the meek, the poor and the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up and heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the physical and spiritual captives, and the opening of the prison and eyes of those who are bound, to comfort all who mourn, to give them beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a heavy, burdened and failing spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, and they shall rebuild the ancient ruins, they shall rise up the former desolations and renew the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. This prophecy of Jesus in Isaiah 61 verse 4 is generational in nature and it is the foundational scripture for healing of the generations. This is the breaking of inherited genetic curses and inherited familiar spirits in your family trees with regards to spiritually, psychologically and biologically inherited diseases. A word of caution. My advice with regards to researching your family history must be taken within balance. I am by no means suggesting that you go on a mad witch hunt trying to find out every small detail of iniquity in your family tree. The devil likes to come in here and take this way out of balance by getting us bogged down in hours and hours of counseling trying to deal with every little thing that's happened over the last 100 years. It is not complicated. For example, if you have cancer and your family members in the generations before you had cancer, then you know that the cancer you have has a genetically inherited component to it because other family members have it as well. We've learned that behind most cancers is bitterness and unforgiveness. So you search your heart and you will probably realize that you have unforgiveness and bitterness towards somebody over an issue in the past. So you need to repent for that bitterness and forgive that person. But that is not the end of it. You also need to repent for the sins of your fathers because this cancer is also genetically inherited. 
You have bitterness and Please forgive me and my fathers before me for the sin of not loving ourselves as you commanded us to in your word. I repent for a low self-esteem and guilt that opened the door for the curse of depression. I break the power of this genetically inherited curse of depression in my life and in my descendants in Jesus' name. I claim forgiveness through the blood of Jesus for my sins and the sins of my fathers also. And Father, in faith, I thank you for my healing. It's that simple. That took less than five minutes, not hours and hours of prayer about every little thing that your ancestors did in the past a hundred years. You also do not have to go and create chaos by getting all your other family members involved. This is not necessary. You just come before God and get your own heart right with him. You can break the curse of genetically inherited diseases that are running through your family tree with a simple prayer like I have just demonstrated where it is just you and God. In session 9 I explained that God's perfect will is actually not healing. His perfect will is that you don't get sick. Would you like to prevent disease in your children? Then you need to deal with the generational iniquities and junk that is flowing through your family tree so that your children do not inherit the curse. Look at your family history and you will see the same diseases, personality traits and characteristics of relationships repeating themselves. Divorce, adultery, abuse, fathers and sons or mothers and daughters fighting and hating each other. These spiritual and physical problems are going to be passed along until somebody takes a stand and says enough is enough and breaks the cycle. Are we just going to go on a roller coaster ride from generation to generation and do nothing about it? The curse of genetically inherited diseases will continue down the bloodline until it is stopped by repentance and by appropriating by faith the redemption provided by Jesus on the cross. My advice to engaged couples who are about to get married is to have a look at what they are bringing into the family package. If we want to do our children a favor, let's give them a break from genetic birth defects, genetically inherited diseases, and psychological problems by repenting for the sins of our fathers. Let's get our hearts and lives right before God so that we can break the power of sin generationally and begin a new dynasty of people of God that change the destiny of the planet. Deuteronomy 30 verse 19 says, I call heaven and earth to witness this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, the blessings and the curses. Therefore choose life that you and your descendants may live. And you are the God that heals.